Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of EdTech Monday Kenya, the May edition. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. I am your moderator and host for this edition. And this month we're focusing on what exactly parents want. Has this period, the last one year, evolved how they're looking into education technology? A very fascinating conversation we're just about to have. How are parental perceptions of EdTech evolved? Now, it is no doubt that parental involvement in a child's learning process from the early years to high school remains among the key factors contributing to a child's success in school and life. It is widely associated with better learning outcomes, school improvement and lower risk of early school leaving and greater educational aspirations. Today we want to focus on the parents and we're asking, have parents' attitudes towards technology changed, uh, prioritization, usage, as well as, you know, paying for these education technology tools. Has this changed? What needs to be done? What more can the parents tell us that we haven't taken into consideration? Allow me to introduce my guests to us um, as we have this conversation. Grace Ngugi Miner is the Deputy Director, Department of Special Programs at the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. We have Lydia Njuguna, who is a Supervisor, Projects and Accounts Management at M. Shule, and Anrita Njirumugo, who is a parent and the Chief Operations Officer at Grod. Ladies, it's such an honor to have you uh, for this conversation particularly. And I'm going to start with Grace Minor. The content, the quality that we are receiving today, parents' adoption of education technology is diverse. Some have picked on faster than others. What can you tell us about the content and the quality so far? Thank you very much, Doreen. And I'm certainly very delighted to be in this show today. And I would just want to say that uh, actually COVID-19 pandemic has revealed to all of us that um, education doesn't have to be confined to the four walls of the classroom. Uh, learning has been going on in spite of the COVID pandemic. And I want to appreciate the fact that there, we've had very many um, service providers out there supporting children to continue learning, and we want to appreciate um, those service providers. KICD is charged with the responsibility of ensuring that um, um, curriculum is developed and quality curriculum is developed for that matter. We package content and deliver this content through different multimedia elements. You are probably aware that we have um, the Edu Channel, KICD Edu Channel TV. We also use um, the KBC English service and we've also now embraced our Radio Taifa to deliver lessons to our learners. And I want to say that uh, the content we develop is actually um, quality content. It is developed by subject specialists together with curriculum specialists and education media service officers. And that is critical because you have to make sure that um, the kind of content learners interact with or teachers deliver to the, con to the learners is quality content. All right. Um, I want to come to Anrita. Anrita, you're a parent, just like we all are. Um, but I want to hear your personalized view of this disruption of education with technology. Tell us about the changes you've observed uh, throughout the past year, as well as the early parts of 2021. Do you think that there are key concerns that you as a parent have observed that you would like to tell us about that we might not know. Thank you, Doreen, uh, for having me on the show and thank you for the question. Well, speaking as a parent of three young children, two of whom are school going age, I will say that just like many other industries, education is being disrupted by technology. And I don't think any of us as parents or any key stakeholders in the industry can run away from that. However, I can also say that there's a lot of reception to the technology, and this is evidenced by the many edtech startups that are coming up, and also seeing that the parents are engaging with these edtech startups and are actually willing to pay for their 
their children to be able to learn through the same. Um, I think something else that is very important to note is that the perception of edtech or technology in education is actually influenced by how economically empowered their parents are. So for example, for um, upper and middle income families, when the pandemic hit, then adjusting to online um, learning for the children was not very difficult because they had access to internet and access to devices for the children. Unlike families that are in the lower income brackets, where one, they don't have the opportunity to work from home, so they are not available to offer that support to their children. And secondly, they are not economically empowered enough to afford the internet access and the devices that are required for the same. In terms of concerns, privacy around data is, is a big deal for parents. I'll also say safety for the children because we all know um, the internet space can be a bit risky in terms of what the children are exposed to and who they interact with. So that's a concern that needs to be addressed. Uh, I'd also say how equipped you feel as a parent to support your children through um, the edtech interaction and learning. And finally, affordability. Those are quite a number of concerns and it's good that you mentioned the issue of safety, especially for the children because sometimes they go unsupervised when they're going through some of this content and the internet as well at play. Um, we'll come back to this and probably pick Grace Miner's brain on this. But Lydia, I want to come to you. Um, at Mshule, you're doing a lot of content as well. Um, and you're trying as much as possible to make sure that this content reaches out, not just to those who are technologically enabled, but even those who aren't. But with the assumption that not all parents have jumped onto the edtech wagon, um, is there any evidence or any reports uh, per se that we can use to assess how useful technology has been uh, during this time for parents, teachers, as well as the learners. How would you assess that? Uh, this is just an assumption because as is currently we know in any Kenyan household, um, technology uh, devices are already in use. Uh, we even see in the public spaces, public offices, people are using ticketing. So it's not that parents are um, slow in jumping into the technology bandwagon, but it's just that I feel like um, in the whole edtech community, we've not done enough to involve the parents um, in learning in technology learning, in learning through phones, laptops, and all other devices. And I think at this point, um, the whole edtech community has picked up that conversation, and you're already looking into ways which we can involve our parents. So uh, this is a conversation that you are having, and you're already looking into ways, for example, um, coming up with products that support child and parent learning. Uh, like at M. Shule, in partnership with Ubongo and uh, being supported by Keep Kenya Learning Project, uh, we've started and involved parents in a learning project where they, they are supposed to learn with their kids uh, in subjects such as numeracy, um, emotional intelligence, and health and hygiene. These are very simple things uh, that parents actually appreciate and when they learn and see that they actually work, we'll have more parents come on board because they know what they are talking about and what they are supporting. All right, I like that, that you say that they know what they're talking about and what they're supporting. But let's talk about the parents who did not acquire formal education and so the pickup on technology might or may be a bit of a challenge. Do you think, and using the fact that, or using the background that previously some parents would just hand over the children to the schools and say, let them get the education. But now with education technology, the parent is also playing a big role. Do you think that now parents' perception is changing with the fact that they now have to be there as their children learn using education technology tools? Um. The best part, I think this is something that you've also experienced and probably see outside, um, is that technology has been built and uh, customized to also fit this criteria of parent that you're speaking about. Um, we know 
in almost every household in Kenya, there is at least one uh, technological device. It could be a feature phone, it could be a TV, it could be a remote, but it's a device that uh, require uh, technology operating here and there. And uh, with that in mind, is when, uh, when developers come up with products, products that they expect maybe parents will play a very key role um, in supporting maybe learning of their learners, uh, they make sure that the products are one, very usable, and I know uh, maybe cyber safety is a concern for parents, and this is where now we as edtechs are uh, come i uh, try to also support that give tips and also you know tips that parents can look out for to see whether their children are being you know uh, involving themselves in things that are not helpful to them and rita i want to come back to you and using a scenario of a report by Acumen East Africa where they said that in counties like Turkana, radio is the preferred platform for education technology learning or uh, remote learning per se. But in Nairobi County, you find that the devices are being preferred. Devices By devices, I mean smartphones or feature phones, um, as well as laptops and such like devices. So is this a question of cost of a quality because the assumption is that the parents in Turkana can or would prefer radio and the parents in Nairobi for instance would prefer internet enabled education. Is it cost of a quality and how do we go about that? A very interesting question Doreen and it's even more interesting because the two counties that are being compared here Nairobi and Turkana are very different in terms of historical government uh, investments. So traditionally we know that Trukana is one of the counties that has been marginalized for a very long time. And what that means is both in terms of technology and education levels and how parents are equipped to support their children affects the mode of delivery that they would prefer. So for me, it's really not a question of cost of a quality, but more practicality and effectiveness. So I've actually been privileged to work in Trukana County before, and it's a very vast county. And some of the very remote areas, you'll find that uh, some technology is yet to get there. It hasn't penetrated geographically that much. And therefore I understand why a parent in Trukana would be more comfortable with um, delivering or supporting their child to learn through radio because that is something they've interacted with before and they are more comfortable. And I must say that there's been a lot of um, effort by the government and private sector to grow this investment in the county. All right, interesting. And Grace Moina, I want to come to you and using what uh, Anrita just mentioned in terms of the, the families and, and how uh, big of families we might find in counties like Turkana. Um, and then there's the scenario of the parent decided that they're going with the radio to the garden <laughs> or to the shamba. In that case, what happens? Do you have to drag the child all the way to the shamba so they can go learn there? Um, but above and beyond that, we also want to talk about the usability of edtech tools among parents. Just like there is a digital divide among the learners, the same applies to the parents. How do we increase usability of edtech tools um, in the country today among parents? The issue of education technology is still a fairly new phenomena in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So you will find that uh, some parents, in, um, especially in the rural areas, are still hesitant in embracing education technology. Uh, secondly, um, most parents are actually what we'd call uh, device immigrants, as opposed to our children who are digital natives. So what that means is that um, parents are yet to really embrace the need to have their children interacting with family gadgets as a media of communication or as ICT that can actually be used to access education. But uh, I think the scenario is changing with time. So parents are actually beginning to realize that technology is here right. and education through technology is here to stay and it is the way to go. So if I'm going to the farm, then I need to actually sit down with the child and establish 
how the radio programs are going to look like. I will need to know whether there are radio lessons that will be taking place in the course of the day. So that if I'm dad, then I can actually choose not to go with the radio to the shopping center and allow the child to interact with the radio so that they can access learning. If it is my mobile phone, then I'll also make sure that it has enough bundles so that my child can access learning. So parents are beginning to open up a great deal and you're beginning to say that you're not uh, device migrants anymore. We are beginning to say that learning has to go on. But we still are keen on making sure that uh, we don't create an impression to the learners that uh, these devices are actually replacing the role of the teacher in learning. So there has to be both. It has to be blended learning. All right. Um, Anne Rita, I'm coming to you now. In, in your observation and with the kind of work that you do as well, do you think that parents are now more willing to pay for education technology tools or education technology learning uh, with things such as gadgets, you know, the data bundles that come alongside it? Do you think that is happening and is it happening fast or you think that's going to take a bit of time? Um, I think it's happening and it was a bit slower before the pandemic set on. But once COVID was here with us and we saw, of course, the schools being closed by the government and so on, parents were forced to shift their perception faster and were actually actively engaging with uh, technology and ed techs to see how they could support their children so that they could learn from home. However, like I mentioned earlier, we always have to remember that there's that demographic that is not as economically empowered. And we have to be very um, intentional, if I can use that as a word, as ed tech startups to make sure we manage the risk of now widening the gap further between families that are economically empowered and those that are not. Okay, and um, I want to come to you, um, Lydia, because when we're talking about paying for education technology tools, in the event that parents cannot pay for these tools, what do you think are the other resources that they can utilize to achieve the same? Parents are spending so much money on educational products and just around the whole education. Um, and we know like when they spend, they're actually investing on their children and uh, any investment is a risk. So uh, what we can do as a tech, because uh, um, we need to find that sweet balance where we are able to fund our operations, we are able to deliver our products to the parents, but um, at the same time, we are trying to reduce the risk uh, of the parents' investment. And uh, looking at this, and uh, I know our fellow parent here has also mentioned um, that uh, we are working with parents of uh, different economic backgrounds. But at the end of the day, we need to accommodate all of them because uh, we aim for impact for all these children in Kenya. And uh, I think at text at this point, now that you are alive to that factor, you are alive that um, our products are actually needed across board. We can start looking at other business models, such as now moving from B to C to more to B to B and uh, B to G. Uh, this will. Uh, take the load of payment uh, from the parents, which will make parents more receptive and more acceptable to edtech products. Um, we can also look at other models such as um, having a shared value uh, between the edtech and the parent. So there are so many ways we can look at this. We just need to be creative to make sure that we include the whole society. All right, including the entire society. Um, Grace Miner, in the spirit of leave no child behind and leave no parent behind, do you think that remote learning is a possibility in Kenya's education system? As curriculum developers, is this a possibility that we could look at that in case a student missed a lesson, they can still get it ahead of time or they can still go back to it as and when they please to enable personalized learning? Yeah, absolutely, Doreen. Um, remote learning is really the way to go. And uh, besides Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, there are other service providers that should also come on board. We need to think about issues of connectivity. 
So we need a number of other stakeholders to come in to support um, uh, digital learning. We need uh, people who can actually engage in um, uh, prosocial behavior like providing bundles so that learners can access learning to actually find their space mm -hmm. in making sure that learners who come from hard rich places or who live in um, pockets of poverty can access these bundles so they can also learn just like any other, any other person. And the parents being the stakeholders, how yes. do we bring them on board as well? Um, I think we need to embrace simplicity as a very important value to this uh, effect. We need to help the parents actually have their confidence high in terms of using uh, devices. We know that we have uh, parents are at different levels as far as um, uh, technology literacy is concerned. So it is our responsibility as education stakeholders to make sure that we have raised their confidence so they can use their mobile phones and other digital devices at home. We also need to help parents to know that uh, technology is not all evil, that it, it can actually be a gadget that can enhance learning to their children. And so we, we are moving away from just thinking about that learning only takes place in the four walls of a classroom and that the teacher should actually take the center stage. Now with technology, we need to really help the parents to appreciate that they have to reach out, they have to even um, engage in webinars or Zoom meetings to learn more about technology and to also get out of their way to be courageous enough to talk with their children about um, netiquette, that is proper use of technology. They need to know about cyberbullying, but that can only happen to a parent who has already been educated on matters, technology. So we need to create awareness for the parents on the importance of technology, that it is the way to go, it is here to stay. So they also have a responsibility in helping their children to settle down and embrace the concept of education in technology. All right, so reaching more with just little resources. But as we bring this to a close, I want to ask the rest of the panelists as well, Lydia and Anrita, how do we make parents part of the education technology support system um, in addition to what Grace has mentioned? I think uh, what I've had uh, Grace mention, uh, she say that uh, parents think that we are technology immigrants. Um, so that really tells a lot about how we need to create uh, some sort of behavior change in our society. And that can only be done through, you know, cons consistently speaking to parents, educating them on, um, you know, uh, the best practices around using devices. And then um, I also think that um, as we come up with these products, as we build uh, these products that you want our parents and learners to use, let's build them with parents. Let's uh, build with parents. Let's involve them from the inception all the way uh, to when the learner is actually accessing them. And I think with that, we'll have gotten their buy-in. We'll have teachers um, who are also parents who will be promoting this in schools, in class, and actually even using some of these products in class to teach. All right, uh, Anrita. I couldn't agree more with Lydia. So firstly, there needs to be participation of the parents throughout the whole process, also allowing them to give feedback and um, using that feedback to improve uh, our products in terms of edtech. Secondly, I would say also there needs to be a lot of customer education. We need to educate the parents um, around our products and how they are aligned to the current um, education that the children are already undertaking. And then I would also say community, we need to build a sense of community for the parents. So there's that also, uh, if we can facilitate that peer-to-peer -peer learning and aspect between the parents, that would be great. All right, Grace, I'll give you the last word as we bring this to a close. What is your message to the parents out there all across the country, including those with children with special needs? Mm -hmm. uh, my word to the parents is that um, if you're going to have healthy interpersonal relationship with our children, if you're going to be um, uh, key stakeholders on matters of learning and uh, success, as far as academic achievement is concerned for our learners, we must really embrace technology. 
children prefer even virtual relationships. And so let us try as much as possible to actually also up our game as far as embracing technology is concerned. Let us get involved and let us just embrace the fact that we are actually um, digital immigrants yes. and we need to catch up with our children who are uh, digital natives. But we must also not just be waiting to be taught how to even use our own gadgets by our own children. We should actually up our game in as far as using those uh, gadgets are concerned so that children can also feel confident as they engage us, you know, in uh, the use of technology. Okay, upping our game. I think that's the, that's the word we need to end this conversation with. We all need to up our game when it comes to education technology tools. And I would like to say thank you to these great panelists we had here today. Uh, Grace Ngugi Minor, the Deputy Director, Department of so uh, Special Programs, KICD, and Lydia Njuguna, Supervisor, Projects and Accounts Management at M. Shule, and Anrita Njiro Mugo, who is a parent and COO or Chief Operations Officer at GROAD. Thank you so much for making this conversation even more interesting and for sharing the great insights as well on the conversation about what parents want and whether or not technology is helping them evolve and as well change their attitudes toward education technology tools as well as paying for these tools to help advance education and learning. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. I've been your moderator. We'll do this again next month where we will have a conversation on open-ended resources and whether or not they can be sustainable. Until then, I also want to say a big thank you to our sign language interpreter, Rose Omolo. Thank you so much for a great work that you do. Until next month, bye for now.